Good morning and welcome to today's Cybersecurity Summit Power Hour. My name is Rick. I'll be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please submit a question using the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded for rebroadcast. We'll be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of each of today's presentations. We encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Please keep the drop down as all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Bradford Rand, CEO of the Cybersecurity Summit. Bradford, we have the floor. Great. Thank you, Rick, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is actually our final power hour. We've done this for the last three months since this crisis uh, began to give you the most uh, up-to-date facts from a cybersecurity uh, perspective. And there has been a tremendous amount of crime in the, uh, in the cybersecurity area right now. So these have been uh, wonderful power hours. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a great lineup of speakers. And uh, so Rick said, sit back, enjoy. And if you have any questions, just put that in the chat box or in the Q&A box, and we will get to as many as we can. If you join us for the entire session today, we're gonna email you a CPE certificate via email. Give us uh, two or three days. Uh, additionally, uh, the slides from today's presentation will be up on cybersummitusa.com. Uh, throughout the rest of the year, we're gonna be producing 16 virtual cybersecurity summits. Uh, they are about a half a day long, and uh, all of those dates are on our website. So with that uh, being said, let's bring on Kristen Judge. She is the founder of the Cybercrime Support Network. She's spoken with us before. She has a wonderful background in the industry. Kristen, uh, can you hear us? Yes, thank you, Bradford. Okay, wonderful. Take it away. We'll see you uh, at the, uh, in about 20 minutes. Great. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. Let me go the right direction here. Uh, we are a public-private partnership. I run the Cybercrime Support Network. We're a nonprofit coming together to make sure that cybercrime victims, uh, we're talking about consumers and small businesses, have a voice and have the resources they need. I've been in the industry working on the education and awareness side uh, for about 12 years, but I realized um, education awareness is good, but what happens after someone is a victim? And we know that it's about one in four Americans every year. So we created the Cybercrime Support Network to address that issue on a national level. We want to help people to report the cybercrime. Uh, we need to increase reporting. We need to help them recover. And then we want them to reinforce their security after they've been a victim. I have a corny, a corny saying, um, when there's been a breach, it's the best time to teach. So we think that when, when people come to us with an issue, we can help them uh, put in more security because they're thinking about it. We have an incredible board um, coming from public and private sector that really help us drive um, uh, our, our reach and uh, put together you know, where we should be going and our, vi our vision and our mission. I'm very thankful to them. And we partner with probably almost 100 organizations now. This is just a, a few that I like to highlight. Um, we're very thankful for the folks that work within the cyber industry on information sharing, threat analysis, uh, partnering with us, and then our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners, uh, along with victim services agencies. So this is just a small uh, group subset of our partners. So when we started CSN in 2017, we said there's a problem in the US right now. Number one, we don't know how many victims there are of cybercrime uh, every year because we're not really doing a good job of counting them. And we don't know what the true cost is until we count the cybercrime victims. And then if someone is a victim, they don't know where to start. We'll hear from victims and say, well, I filed a report here and here, and then I called this agency and that agency, and I still got no one to call me back. And there really isn't a clear path to get to the help that they need. We don't necessarily have enough resources yet to help everybody, and we're not gonna be promising that we can get people's money back, but there are things that victims need, and so we're putting together those resources and trying to drive that conversation. 
I'm sure many of you have looked at the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center statistics. And I'd like to point this out because um, I want to show the true impact of cybercrime from our best guesstimate. Because I, like I said, we don't count all the victims right now, so we really don't even know how many there are. But in 2019, the Internet Crime Complaint Center got 450,000 complaints. So of those 450,000 Americans that complained about a cybercrime incident, they lost $3.5 billion with, with a B. Okay, so if we think about what are the true statistics, one in four Americans are a victim of cybercrime, that would be a $300 billion loss every year. This is what people are not talking about. We talk about, you know, the cost to businesses and corporations, but we don't talk about the cost to my grandmother and your uncle and our kids and other people, small businesses. If people are losing $300 billion a year, this is another economic crisis on top of other economic crises, crises we are having. So it needs to be addressed. People will sometimes say, well, what do you define as cybercrime? And uh, when I first started this company, I thought, okay, I went to the federal government, state government, county, and said, what's the definition of cybercrime and what are the categories? And I found there's quite a few different definitions, few different categories and taxonomies. And I got involved in bringing together elected officials and uh, private sector, public sector to build what should be the national standard for cybercrime taxonomy for law enforcement to use. Um, and so we know there's the MITRE attack and all of those things that are great for technicians, but we're working on the taxonomy for law enforcement, people on the ground working with these crimes and helping the victims. Because if we don't have the same language when we're reporting these crimes, we won't be able to count them. So it always goes back to our same mission of counting the victims and getting them the resources they need. One of the, the key areas that we focus on are uh, the consumers, especially military members, seniors, uh, people who are in a, a position where they're losing a lot of money, and if they do lose that money, they're not able to recover. So there's the grandparent scam, the romance scam, um, and I'll tell you about um, a scam that just happened to a family member of mine. Um, the bad guys follow the obituaries, and I, I always knew that, but I never knew someone who had been impacted by this. Basically, obituaries don't just come in your Sunday paper anymore at your house. They're all online. So I encourage you, if you are, and especially in the time of COVID, you know, there's a lot of obituaries, unfortunately, being written. You shouldn't be listing all of your family members, all of where you live, where you came from, you know, your background, because um, this just happened in my family a week after the obituary went out for my father-in-law. My mother-in-law got a phone call from Connor, which is my son's name, and it said he was in Pennsylvania, which is where my father-in-law was born. It was all stuff out of the obituary, and they tried to scam her because he was supposedly in a car accident and needed money right away because he was visiting someone for a COVID-19 funeral in Pennsylvania. So, you know, this is the kind of folks that are losing money they cannot afford to lose. Fortunately, she knows enough, and she hung up and called him some names, but we need to make sure that people know, where do I start? Okay, I've been a victim of cybercrime. Where do I go now? And this is an actual uh, tweet. There's more that I've found, but the Philadelphia police did get people calling because their YouTube was not working. LA County Sheriff has a tweet about people calling because their Facebook wasn't working. And they're calling 911. To some people, that's an emergency, uh, but we don't want our 911 systems clogged with identity theft questions, romance scam questions, and so on. But people want a local place to call, a simple number to remember, and it's important that we give them uh, the resources that they need. I call this slide the hotline issue because there are resources available for cybercrime victims. But if you just Google, I've been hacked, you're going to get 8 million pages of resources. How do you know, as a consumer or small business, where to go to get the help? So. There are great resources. We just wanna make sure people get into the system and get to the right place the first time they access it. We have some great international partners that we're using best practices from. What we're trying to do in the US is really mimic some of these other countries who are a bit ahead of us. Um, so we work closely with Congress trying to educate them on what happens um, 
and I'll talk a little bit about some funding from CISA. But in the UK, Canada, and Israel, I just talked to Australia, they have one number to call or one um, email to report, and then people are sent to what they, the place they need to go to get help. And they're given triage help. They're given help with their computer. Um, they find that obviously about 50%, there's no law enforcement reaction for it because the bad guys are maybe in a foreign country we can't cooperate with, they can't be found, they hid through VPNs, whatever it may be. But we do know we need to have a national response to support cybercrime victims. And that's what we're working on. So, so far at CSN, we have built fraudsupport.org. And the impetus for this really was we were doing a survey with 911 dispatchers. And we said, what do you need um, to be able to deal with the issue of cybercrime? And they said, can you just create a website? So if someone calls with identity theft or uh, you know, a romance scam, we at least have somewhere to send them. So they don't like the, they don't like to have to hang up on someone and say, I can't help you. I mean, they're public servants. So we've had over 600,000 people visit this website in the past year and a half and get help and triage themselves. Um, it's either individuals or businesses can come here. If you're an individual and you visit the site, we've broken down the categories. Um, most cyber crime category, uh, cyber crimes fit into these five categories. And then if you click on financial purchase scams, for example, you'll have nine more categories. And the reason for that is there's different kinds of financial purchase scams. And depending on which one that's happened to you, there's a different place to go for get, to get help. Um, so then someone could click on online shopping scams. When they go to the page where they're getting to the meet, so they had to click twice to get to where they need to go. And then they're done, they stay on this page. Is this an online shopping scam? So we define it at the top. Here's some immediate things you can do. And then here's how you report it. Here's how you can recover from it. And here's how you can reinforce your security after you've been a victim. Our goal is to prevent re-victimization. And we're finding um, a lot of success, I'll share in a second about that. And then if you're a small business, you can come to our website and triage yourselves. And there's nine categories to start from. And then the same uh, process happens after, like with the individuals. Another thing we've been working with is creating uh, a national network using 211 uh, for cybercrime victims. 211 already exists and it covers 95% of Americans. Um, they provide human services referrals. So if you need help with housing, food, mental health, Two and one does an incredible job of serving Americans, especially in times of COVID. Uh, you may have heard your governors saying, call two and one with any COVID questions. So they are paid through the federal government to be there also in an emergency uh, for communities, whether it's been a hurricane or a pandemic. So they're an incredible partner and we're working with them in the states here that you see uh, listed. Uh, North Carolina and New Jersey are just going live now so if people live in these areas listed on the left, they can call 211 right now and have someone talk to them and help walk them through the next steps if they've been a cybercrime victim. We've also applied for Texas, California, and Florida, hoping to expand there. And, and these partners uh, are mainly United Ways, but we've trained them to triage cybercrime calls. And many of them use fraud support as their um, you know, script as they go through talking to folks. And you can see here, nothing surprising uh, of the people we've served through 211. Imposter scams is number one. That includes romance scams, the grandparent scam, and FBI. I'm the FBI, and you need to give me access to your computer scam, tech support scams, all of those. And then the rest is not very surprising either. On fraud support, romance scams are the number one page that people visit. So we know that that is certainly um, causing some havoc right now. Google came to us uh, as one of our partners and we thought it was important to help people identify a scam as they were in the midst of it. Um, so before they gave away their money, we want people to know, am I really being scammed? So we created Scam Spotter. Um, it's somewhat geared towards seniors, but anybody could benefit from it. And we have three main golden rules. First of all, most scams come in with an urgent plea. We need you to send this money right now. I need, to, I need you to have, you know, click on this link right now. It's very important. And so slow down and then spot check. If it says it's your bank calling you or sending you an email, actually go to the real number of your bank or the real website of your bank and double check and ask with someone. 
And then don't send gift cards. Gift cards are never a form of payment. They are a gift. So if a stranger is asking you to send them a gift card, it's a scam. So we're hoping these three key um, elements here that we've created would help people understand whether or not they're being a victim of a scam before they give up their money. And we are very fortunate to work with CISA. We've got Ron Ford on here too. I'm very honored to be on the same panel with him. CISA has given us a cooperative agreement and we are looking at the feasibility of building a national program like they have in the UK, Israel, Australia, and Canada, where there is one number to call nationwide and we help the, the victims. So we've created a reporting form uh, to be used that can share threat and crime information in a push out with law enforcement uh, and DHS and other people um, that would need threat information. Um, that's gonna be piloted uh, in the next few months. And then we're gonna build a very robust response and victim catalog, um, catalog of resources on fraud support. We've done a gap analysis on over um, 1200 resources and then we're building resources that are missing. There's not a lot of resources out there for small business recovery. And that's what we're really going to try and focus on. If you go to fraud support right now, you'll see our resource library and you can download these and print them uh, or share them online. Uh, everything that we create is there for you to use. So if you want to help your organization uh, be safer or your staff has been a victim of a crime, whether it's at home or at work, there's lots of great resources there for you. We also have videos on our YouTube channel. They're all under a minute. And they tell you, okay, what do I do now? My social media has been hacked. What do I do? And these are great lunch and learn starters. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of lunch and learn where you bring in the video, you have everybody sit down at lunch together. We do it on, uh, on Google Hangouts now at our team and, uh, and then talk to people about what they saw in the video and how they can use it uh, within their own life. So for us at the end of the day, Success is increase in reporting. So we can actually count the victims and help Congress understand what kind of money they need to spend to serve these victims and to provide uh, resources at things like a fusion center or an FBI local field office. We need more people that are cyber investigators. But until you put numbers on the crime, it's hard to get that funding. Increase recovery, increase resources for the victims and a decrease in the re-victimization. Most cybercrime victims are not a cybercrime victim once. It is over and over and over. And we've even heard that on the dark web, they're selling names of people who have been willing to give money in a scam. And then people know that this is a good potential target and they continue to target them. So if we can just decrease re-victimization by say 10% nationwide, we could save uh, billions of dollars. So this is our goal. And we're so thankful to our partners. We, like I said, we're a public-private partnership we just announced yesterday that Craig Newmark has given us a gift to uh, work on a campaign focused on helping military members and veterans and their families uh, because they are disproportionately targeted by cybercrime victims. So that will be coming out early next year. Here's uh, an info email. If anybody would like to reach out and find out more about what we do, uh, please follow us on social media and share our information. And I do Cyber Tip Tuesday live on LinkedIn uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday. So love to have you join me there. It's a quick little tip. And then if you could share that with others, we can get the word out. So thank you, Bradford. Wow, that was, uh, that was right on time. Right on time. I mean, perfect. Usually we have to say, all right, stop talking, give you a little hint. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so the, the process that you're in right now with create this national 211. Um, I think that's just a great idea. Obviously, we changed uh, 911 to 311 for non-critical uh, for non-critical uh, emergencies here. Uh, what needs to happen to to support victims? Is, is there voting? Is there congressional approvals need? You know, what can the public do to kind of put forth, you know, your vision here? Yeah, so be, being a nonprofit public private partnership we need to continue getting grant funding. We need to continue getting private sector funding. And then we need those private sector partners to come to the table with us so that they can help guide our vision. And it's really important that we, you know, we're working with the financial industry and the healthcare industry, because what we build, we don't want it just to benefit the victims and the consumers. We think it will benefit the private sector because then they're gonna have less uh, fraud costs. 
So we really just need them to engage with us, follow us on social media, you know, reach out and, and see if we can partner. How many states now have this? I, I, you mentioned it to me before. Uh, have that yeah, I, think, I think we have. Um, so the 211 specialists are trained, I believe, in six states now. Um, okay. And Florida, it's just the Orlando area. Michigan is just West Michigan. Okay. Well, you have a lot to be proud of. That's, that's just a great, I mean, you've actually started a brand new emergency line. I think that's just, I, I think that's just phenomenal. Uh, we've got a question from Brian here. Uh, Brian asks, uh, what is the typical response time to get back to someone who's reported a scam? That's a great question, Brian. Yeah, so um, when people call 211 in the areas uh, where we have that live for cybercrime victims, they talk to a person right away um, that, you know, when they call in. As far as on our website, uh, yeah. and when people report, there is, no, there is no getting back to them. Our website is created for them to triage themselves. And unfortunately, if someone reports to the FTC or the FBI, they don't get a call back. And that's where, and they've never promised to call back. Um, so that's why we're putting the resources on our website that people can triage themselves and walk them through the steps of recovery. It's purely but, informational, yeah. Yes, but we hope when we have a national program that we would be able to do more like they do in Israel to help the victims and, and actually walk them through the, the changing of their security. Wonderful. Well, great. Well, keep up the great job. And, uh, Thank you. Jack asks, if we want to help, can we? So you can actually probably respond right back to Jack in the chat box. I will. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Email us at info at cybercrime support, and we will get you uh, to help us out. We'd love the help. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. And we will see you at one of our cybersecurity summits coming soon, right? Looking forward to it. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Kristen. Okay. Dave, how are you? Not too bad in yourself. Coming in from cyberspace, like a like a superhero, right on time to save the day. <laughs> I do what, li what little I can. <laughs> well, Dave, I will let you self introduce yourself, so I don't take any of your time. Thanks for joining us again, uh, David. It's always wonderful uh, hearing your presentation. It's very very entertaining. Thank you for having me again, Bradford. Appreciate it. Got it. Okay. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, my name is Dave Lewis. I am a global advisory CISO with Duo Security, which is part of Cisco Systems. Now, today I'm going to be talking about uh, zero trust in the flaming sword of justice. And uh, it's a term that I use uh, rather specifically for somebody I used to work with uh, back in the early 2000s. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But first off, I have been doing security in one form or another now for over 25 years. I mean, if I'm being completely honest about it, I've been doing this since about the early 80s when I was duping video games and selling the kids in school, but that's another story down on the riverbank. Um, I identify myself as a hacker, and uh, if you do a quick search about us on the internet, you find that we are not overly well liked. Um, it's not the criminal hacker, it is the hacker with the sense of curiosity to see how things work and how to make them better, not the criminals which we have to deal with, as Kristen was talking about earlier. I am Canadian, but I have lived in the States for a period of years. Uh, I now back, I'm now back in Canada. And I work for Duo Security, which I mentioned is part of Cisco Systems. And the only vendory thing I'll do is say you can find us on the Cisco webpage. So the one thing that we did miss out on uh, when we brought the two companies together was Duo and Cisco. It could have been Disco. That would have been too much fun. And full credit to my boss, Wendy Nather, for coming up with that one. So our mission is very simple. It's about protecting your mission. And when we're talking about zero trust, it's like, what is that exactly? And it's very simple. It's about the how, the where, the when, you know, where the trust is being, uh, where it's changed. So anywhere an access decision is being made. And I'll tub thump on that one a few times as we go through. It's about continually verifying who is in and what is in the network. And you have to assume that all networks are hostile. Now, if I went around all 242 people that are in the call right now and said, what is love? I can almost guarantee you I'll get a different answer from every single person. Now, when I ask people about zero trust, what does it mean? It's a lot of the same response that I find that I'm getting. So the easiest way I put it is, you know, what is zero trust? It's simple. It's everything's on fire. And once you set that as your baseline, it's easy to approach it. You're looking at everything as hostile and you set that as your benchmark and you can build from there. You want to verify your devices, verify your users, and verify your applications. Because bad things are going to happen, even when they're not intended. I worked at one financial institution years ago where all the code would be reviewed and tested in development before being uh, promoted into production. One time it didn't go well. 
And it wasn't anything out of a uh, sense of malice. It was quite literally something just went wrong. There was one character missing in a line of code, and it brought the entire site to its knees. And as a security practitioner, you find yourself, you know, throwing your hands over your head because you can feel that train coming at you, and you just are constantly dodging trains. And this is one of those things where we have to look at this as a, in a better fashion. We have to no longer look at ourselves as a cost center, as we've been historically referred to, but as an enabler for the business. So what is zero trust? Now, if we go back to around 2003, 2004, we see a paper that was put out by a group called the Jericho Forum, which was about deep parameterization. This was pretty much the forerunner to zero trust, although I've been told that there was a, a talk about this earlier in a DEF CON, uh, DEF CON 1, actually. I'm still hunting that one. If anybody knows about it, feel free to drop me a line. In 2010, John Kinderbog, who was an analyst at Forrester at the time, coined the term zero trust. Now, a lot of people say, oh, it's a marketing term. Not wrong, but there is meat on the bone, and it is about reducing risk in your organization. Now, Google very famously published a paper in 2014 about how their journey to zero trust and, they, and their version of it. The interesting thing here is that people have to take note, this took them over eight years to accomplish this using a dedicated team. That's not a bad thing. It's just level setting because too many times people say, okay, we're going to be zero trust in six months. It's not going to happen. If it is, hats off to you. But the reality is you have to look at it as a game of increments. Now, in 2017, there was a book came out by, on, uh, from the publisher O'Reilly called Zero Trust Networks. If you want to read more, that's a great resource to check out. I don't know the authors. I have no hand in it. It's a very good resource. Now, the landscape has absolutely changed, We, especially with our, our current situation, which I will no wrong, longer refer to as the new normal, but days that end in Y. We're dealing with cloud applications. We're dealing with a mobile workforce and people being able to work from anywhere. And we want to make sure that we're able to enable a multi-cloud access. We need to be able to enable BYOD in situations where it merits it. And when we boil it right down, it's about breach prevention. We need to reduce the risk to the organization because it's our fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we are protecting our assets, our staff, our intellectual property. The old school way of doing things was, it's okay, we have a firewall, everything is fine. No, it wasn't fine. Never was fine. But with a zero trust approach, you're looking at it from the perspective of anywhere an access decision is being made. This is your new perimeter. Now, we all like our triads. We, we're, we know the famous CIA triad. But what about the ADU, or however you want to put it? Apps, devices, and users. This is what you're trying to protect. And there's simple five steps to go through. This is very much a 30,000 foot view, but he gets the point across. You wanna confirm the user identities in your organization. You wanna gain visibility into what they are doing on their devices, as well as what the devices are doing themselves, how they're behaving on your network. You wanna ensure the security of those devices. Make sure they're patched to current or N minus one. You wanna enforce contextual policies. And what that means is you wanna be able to make sure that somebody from finance is not doing changes on the mainframe or you know, erroneously entering dollar bang when they have no idea what they're doing. For those of you with a mainframe background, you know that's fire bad. And then you wanna be able to secure access to all of your applications. You wanna have control over them. You don't wanna have me sitting at a Tim Hortons here in Toronto, Canada, accessing your email when I don't work for you simply because I found the password on a coffee table someplace. I, coffee is a thing with me, so that's why I keep bringing that up. But one of the really interesting things I've learned over time is quite simple, castles simply don't scale. Just because we have a firewall doesn't mean you're secure. It doesn't mean that. I had a CIO said to me once upon a time, he said, it's okay, we have a firewall, everything's fine. We trust everyone who is inside this company. Turned out there was two people in that company that we should not have been trusting in any way, shape, or form. Another story. One of the things we have to make sure is that like, we love to be environmentally friendly, but recycling passwords is not a good idea. There is a better way to do it. There's multi-factor authentication, there's biometrics, there's all sorts of different things like that. And they're on the road to what we can call passwordless, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Password isn't really all that it's cracked up to be. If you have a password, doesn't mean you're supposed to be able to access that network. If I leave a key under the mat in front of my house, doesn't mean that if you find it, you can get it, come into the house. It just means you have found that password. Doesn't validate you in any way, shape, or form. You want to be able to taunt that person that's trying to get into your network if they're not supposed to be there and tell them to go away. So before I ever got into computer security in any way, shape, or form, I was doing a degree in archaeology and classical studies. And one of the lessons, I you know, bet you didn't see that coming. Um, one of the lessons that I learned back then was from the sack of Rome. When the Visigoths came to the city, they surrounded the city and they made sure, um, sorry, 
got distracted by a question popping in there. And they made sure, they made sure that they stifled the city until they ran out of food and water. And at which point the Romans finally said, enough of this, opened up the doors and said, everybody come on in. This showed back then that a perimeter-based security pro, uh, model was demonstrably broken. We have to look at this in a very, very different way in the new normal, which I promised I wouldn't say that, but I just did, so shame on me. But the reality is here, we have to look at it as your perimeter has changed. It is now anywhere an access decision is being made. Now in Canada, we like to go for hikes, and the running joke is you always have to be faster than the hiker behind you in case there's a bear. But these days in the computer sense, we are dealing with bears all over the place. It's about reducing risk. And when you're looking at it from a zero trust perspective, you are making sure that you're verifying all the users, verifying the devices and verifying the applications that they're trying to access. Because we need to do a better job. For back in the early 2000s, roughly about 2002, I was working with somebody who I referred to as the flaming sword of justice. His entire mantra was, how do we get to know? Um, this does nothing to enable the business. It did little more than terrorize the people that were working at the company. And this is absolutely detrimental to, you know, security's vision and roadmap and also, you know, working nicely with others. This is the old way of doing things. As a security practitioner, we have to be able to enable the business, but to do so in a safe and secure fashion. Because data breaches are going to keep coming. S3 buckets are a great example. AWS S3 buckets, for those of you who don't know, it's a data repository you can spin up with a credit card and a web browser. A very handy tool, but when you are setting one of these up, it says in bold print, do not make this publicly accessible unless you actually know what you're doing. The reason being is if you read a lot of the papers uh, over the last couple of years, a lot of people were enabling these things and led to data breaches because unfortunately the people that were setting them up typically didn't have any sort of security inkling and it's no harm on them. It's just as security practitioners, we miss the boat in taking the time to explain to them what the risk was and how to avoid it. The data breaches are going to keep coming. If we look at reports like the Verizon DBIR and things to that effect, we find that weak credentials lead to data breaches as well as compromised devices. We've got to make sure they're patched to current or N minus one, or you know, do something better than passwords. Because we have a porous perimeter. There's all sorts of different ways into the organization. We may think we have a firewall, but there's all sorts of ways in. We have to mature our understanding as to what the perimeter is. And the perimeter, as I said before, is anywhere that an access decision is being made. And full, pro, uh, full uh, credit to my boss, Wendy Nader, that is her line. And it, in my mind, is absolutely accurate. We have remote employees, vendors and contractors, mobile devices, and the list goes on. These are all different ways into the organization. We need to make sure we're focusing on the access. Applications, trusted users, and trusted devices. So back in 2012, apparently I needed a hobby, so I started tracking uh, data breaches at the time. One that jumped out at me um, back in that summer was in, on LinkedIn, where they had six and a half million records that were compromised. And at that time, it was big news. It was rather significant. Now that wouldn't even get a second notice. We have breaches with orders of magnitude of billions of records. Why is this getting worse? It shouldn't be this way. And I know what I'm talking about because I lived through a data breach of one company I was working for. One day I got to work and this was waiting for me on a web server that was supposed to have been taken offline. Um, the group in charge of this web server said, yes, we'll take it down and mea culpa, I didn't follow up with them. And two weeks later, we were on the front page of the newspaper. Not a fun experience. <clears throat> and as you can see, this happens a lot. This is a snapshot from a website called informationisbeautiful.net. I took this about four years ago. And this is a visual representation of data breaches. Uh, I covered up the name so that people wouldn't get upset. But if you jump through to more recently, um, yeah, the, they actually had to change the way they were presenting the data on the website just so it would fit on the screen. So that brings the question, what is open in the United States? So this was a snapshot from a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can, this varies from day to day, but there's 182 million plus ports that were open and listening in the US. Not a bad thing. I mean, you need to open ports in order to do business, but you can understand that there is a certain subset of these that are going to have vulnerabilities baked into them. So for example, when we go through that statistical, statistical analysis of that particular listing, there was 100, or sorry, 1,562 that were susceptible to eternal blue, 18,000 plus that were susceptible to heartbleed, and that is a little bit disconcerting because it's been, you know, what, five years now that that one's been known about? 
Blue Keep, almost 39,000 were vulnerable to that. This is something we can do better. We need to look at trusted access and what the value proposition is. And this goes very much to the zero trust conversation. We wanted to value stolen credentials so that the attackers have less incentive to come after your organization. We want to remove low hanging fruit. We don't want to leave simple um, vulnerabilities that could have easily been patched. And don't get me wrong, I know patching is not as simple as just patch it, and it never is, but having a resilient patch program in place will help with that. You want to complicate lateral movement. You don't want usernames and passwords to be your only method of authentication. You want to have something like multi-factor authentication that the attacker can't get. So they can get your username, they can get your password, but they can't get that other factor. Hopefully not the trusted device as well. You need to make it a game of increments to make it that much more difficult for the attackers. Bastion hosts are something I brought up back in 2003 when I read that paper from Jericho Forum and I was almost run out of the building when I suggested we do that for all our laptops, desktops, and servers. Um, apparently that was a little bit too far ahead of its time. I had no idea how much ahead of its time it was, but now here we are in 2020 having this discussion. And you know what? This is something that is achievable. We can do a better job. Especially when we have remote workforces, we need to understand that we have to be able to enable the business to keep the lights on. We go from the idea of historically of making sure that any system is put in the DMZ is you know, hardened to within a, a, a whisker mm -hmm. of itself. But on the internal network, we'd have systems on the back end that were you know, running full copies of Microsoft Office for whatever reason I've never quite understood. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we're doing a better job of securing the organization. We have to set expectations as to how we're going to get to that point. We need to make sure that we're celebrating the wins as we're going along. I like to refer to as multi-factor authentication as a gateway drug to zero trust. It is a way to reduce risk in your organization, reduce the costs of maintaining your infrastructure because you're not constantly doing password resets. These are the things that once they're in place, you have to celebrate those wins and realize that zero trust is something that you iterate towards. You're never going to get to an end state, but you will reduce the risk in your organization and keep the auditors at bay, hopefully. <laughs> you wanna determine the priorities. What is it that you're trying to protect in your organization and how you're gonna to get to that point? You wanna look at Legitimate credentials are a great example. If you read any number of report that says, you know, it's X number of days before a data breach is noticed, the average seems to be around 200 days. Let's just squeak it right back. Imagine it's seven days, 10 days, whatever. If an attacker had legitimate credentials for that length of time, this is really a bit disconcerting how much damage they could do in a day, let alone before anybody noticed. These are the kind of things that we have to take into account. Simple passwords just don't cut it anymore. And we want to make sure that the, act, the devices we're using are patched to current or N-1 to reduce the amount of risk that we're looking at. Got to verify your users, verify their devices, and protect every application. Want to make sure that we're doing it in such a way that we are controlling who gets access to what for the right reasons. Trusted users. We want to make sure that the stolen credentials are not a problem. You want to have that second factor to make sure that you're limiting the risk to the organization. Trusted devices. Make sure that the device is supposed to access your network. If you're using BYOD, that's fine, but be able to set up a policy that will control access to what they can get to, so just email or whatever it happens to be, depends on the risk profile for your organization. You want to be able to make sure that it patches the current or N-1, which is something I say a lot. But this is a great example. You can set it up to self-manage. So if a browser is out of date, the user can just update it and you can give them the steps on how to do it. And making sure that that is the way because you don't want to introduce new vulnerabilities into the organization. Every application that you're using, whether it's Salesforce, with Outlook 365, whatever it happens to be, you wanna make sure you're controlling who accesses it because you don't want Dave at the coffee shop trying to get access to your network when I'm not supposed to be there. And then the ability, the ability to get granular access controls. For example, you don't want D1 countries mm -hmm. that are trying to access your network for whatever reason, um, because well, there, there are legal ramifications there. You want to be able to make sure that devices that are coming in are not using deprecated software that hasn't been patched in the last four or five years. A zero star shopping, shopping list is a really good way to look at it. You want to have an asset inventory for everything mm -hmm. in your organization. You want to do proper user management, making sure that the users that are in your network are the ones that are supposed to be there and in not actually somebody who is deceased with super user status that their ac account is still active and being used. Not that I lived through that more than once. Um, uh, it was actually only once, but that was unpleasant. 
Device management, a defined repeatable process is fantastic for reduce, reducing risk and you don't need any vendor to do this. You can do this yourselves today. Make sure that you are testing it and making sure that it is something that is repeatable so that you can have your organization reducing that risk. ITIL is a great example of this. And yes, I actually said that out loud. User entity and behavior analytics. This is an idea of looking at all the data you're collecting once you have multi-factor authentication and endpoint verification, all those sort of things. You're collecting all of this information. You can feed it into your centralized logging solutions as well as then looking at network zone segmentation. You don't want to be working at a, a company with 18,000 employees with a flat network where I can sit at my desk in Toronto and query systems in Germany and uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, I lived through that and it wasn't pleasant. But these are the kind of things that unfortunately exist far too often in too many organizations. The authentications must continue to flow. The attackers are going to look at your network from all sorts of different levels. This is an example of submarine cables that you know, comprise the internet around the world. This is just one of the many, many layers that gets up to your browser. The attackers will look at all of them. So we have to reduce the risk wherever we can. So remember those ports that we went through, I went through and did a quick subset of the uh, SSH ports that were running. There was over 8 million SSH ports listening. And this was just a random sample in the first 10 that I pulled out that had multiple severe vulnerabilities. Encrypt everything at rest, at flight, in flight rather, you don't need to leave things in the clear because it's just not worth the headache. It is imminently achievable in this day and age. There's a better way forward. We can look at moving towards biometrics. We can look at moving towards a passwordless future. WebAuthn is a great example. This is an open standard uh, published by the W3C on how you can access web delivered uh, applications in a what's called a passwordless fashion. If you do anything else other than this, this or sorry, if you take nothing else away from this doc other than this, please look up WebAuthn to uh, look into the information here. This is actually a great open standard. All right, quickly, assume networks are hostile, establish a trust engine, reduce your threat surface, and continually validate and keep it as simple as possible. You want to make sure that you're going through and having this shopping list ready to go before you talk to any vendor. You need to have a good understanding as to what you're protecting. The, th the flaming sword of justice that I referred to earlier is dissolving. More and more CISOs that I talk to on a regular basis are changing the way they're thinking, they're changing their approach, and it is getting better so that we as security practitioners are becoming an enabling force for the business to make sure that it's being done safely and securely while reducing the cost cost rather. We do not need to throw the holy hand grenade of Antioch every time we see a problem. Thank you everyone for listening. I do appreciate your time today. And if you have, want to get in touch with me, feel free to drop me an email or hit me up on Twitter. And I really do understand that your time is valuable and thank you so much for tuning in today. Hey, thank you so much for joining us again, Dave. My pleasure. Great. I think you'll be joining us at some of our virtual summits. Uh, in the future, so uh, we look forward to uh, to seeing you again. I'm just wondering how long your beard is going to be. Well, you know, I needed some growth in my life, so I figured I'll see how you know winter is coming in Canada. So you know, okay. Well, these power hours and and summits, you know, I, I need growth up uh, up there in my head. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. I think you've addressed just about everything, so I think we are good to go, and we are running right on time. So again, thank you again for that entertaining and very informative uh, briefing, and we will see you again soon. All right, thank you, cheers. We've got it. Okay, let's bring up our next speaker, Grant. Uh, Grant from Checkpoint, can you hear me, Grant? Yes, I can. Perfect, okay. Uh, if you'd like to turn on your video so we can uh, see your handsome self or not, is that okay? Are you seeing my screen now? We see your screen. Are you going to join Terrific. us? Are you going to join us uh, visually, or are you just going to do the screens? I thought I clicked on, but uh, hey, there you go. You are on. I muted myself. Okay, so now All right. I'm going to switch away. back to my application. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Wow, those were a couple of outstanding presentations. Uh, tough acts to follow. I'll do my very best. I've got about a gallon of milk for a half gallon container. And so the last thing I'm going to do is spend any time on me other than to say, I helped open up an Apple dealership back in 1983 and I couldn't spell computer. 
I fell into the security industry in 98 when Checkpoint acquired a company I worked for that was the first to port bind to Windows. I couldn't spell VNS at the time. And I've been in cybersecurity specifically since 1998 with a whole lot of stuff that's happened in between them, but we won't bother. So I'm gonna be talking about why we need to worry about protecting ourselves from ourselves and what's going on. First, just kind of at a high level, I think most all of you have heard these statistics, so I'm not gonna belabor them, but suffice to say, the market is exploding for cloud. I mean, it really makes a lot of sense, but I have a little bit of a different perspective I'd like to share. Because while we get so excited about this phenomenal growth, we need to temper it a bit. This year, we'll spend about $4 trillion. But if you compare the data from 2018, we're spending less than 5% on cloud services. So from my perspective, we need to do a much better job teaching and showing and demonstrating the power of this elastic breathing almost a live compute environment that we can take care of. Now, I'm a simple man and I've got simple examples. How many of you got one of these running behind your uh, business or home? Yeah, it's because it just makes so much sense, right? It's so much easier in so many ways. And this is exactly why, in my opinion, we're gonna, uh, when I had the wonderful pleasure of being in a a uh, conference uh, hosted by IDC, and the analyst said, we're all going to be moving to the cloud. It's just going to take 40 or 50 years. And I think that was really an accurate way of putting it. Now, the way I look at it is for the last decade or two, you've been the captain of your own ship. You pick your own port. You chart your own course. You pick the food you put in the cupboard. Truly, the captain of your own ship. Ah, but things are changing now. And I always kind of jokingly say, you know, you're renting a slightly larger boat. Now, some of you may laugh at this, but the fact of the matter is that previous boat that you've been captaining will never have more than one or two bedrooms. And it's only when you get a new boat, you're going to have more bedrooms and mixing metaphors, of course. In this world, if I want more servers, if I want more capacity, I just have to have it configured to accommodate me and I'll have it and then it'll go away. So it really truly is an accurate representation. And you have to remember, this is a, 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 a boat built for Fortune 1 and Fortune 1 million. And there are lots and lots of things that can get you into trouble. And what you really need is the training, the resources, and the knowledge and expertise to go in and really be the captain of this ship. Now, there are things you're not gonna see in your data center that you are gonna see occurring in the cloud, and one of them is Sprawl. Now, I'm sure many of you remember back when virtualization came about, Sprawl was a challenge inside your virtual environment. And we had new problems, right? Inter-VM communications and vMotion. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, to quote the famous uh, late great Yogi Berra, man, it is a deja vu all over again, only exacerbated because now I don't even have to, I don't have to have a card key. I don't have to be in your building, but I literally can spin up with a credit card, as uh, was mentioned earlier, and, and I, I, I've got my own account somewhere. So sprawl is a huge problem. You really got to keep an eye on it. Now, the other thing that you just don't see is a server pop up in Chicago and then disappear and another pop up over in uh, Los Angeles. We, we, this doesn't occur dynamically and automatically like it does in the cloud. And in fact, it is this ephemeral, elastic, what I call breathing, heaving world that we love. And I would suggest there's never been a time more than the last three months that demonstrates the unbelievable power and benefit of this ephemeral environment. Because if, no matter which end of the stick you're on, going from a high utilization to, whew, I don't need it so much because my business has changed, or the opposite, we have the power of this ability to breathe, literally spin up, accommodate, and then spin down. But all of these capabilities introduce new challenges for all of us. 
Now, lastly, I mentioned, you know, something as simple as maintaining consistency and compliance on, uh, uh, in your data center compared to the cloud is vastly different because we have to deal with a different scale. And your ability to consistently apply policy and ensure compliance as you heave and breathe and your scale changes, this is where it gets to be difficult. Now, we did a study, we're compiling the results from our study this year that asked some 600,000 constituents from the Cybersecurity Insiders, you know, what's your deployment? I would suggest you're gonna see this multi-cloud uh, uh, explode uh, hybrid continue to increase as well, and single cloud environments are gonna go down. You can compare how that stacks to you. But what are the headaches? Well, it's a tight race for number one. It's a very close number two, but we've heard these. It's compliance and visibility. And I would even say that, that you have to have one in order to have the other. But uh, the fact that compliance uh, is first, I think really highlights the challenges and the nuances of maintaining compliance in this new world compared to maintaining compliance in the old world. And again, I'm a simple man. This is how I describe it. Your data center, your on-premise data center, that's the image on the left. The image on the right, that's the cloud. Now, on the left, you're worried about chlorine and pH and whether or not there's enough water in the pool. Because if there's not, you get the hose, you fill it up. The one on the right, you're probably more worried about something biting you or eating you, and as the waterfall implies, it's constantly changing, constantly moving. But they're both places to go swimming. No one can dispute that. And so, you know, when you look at these are both data centers, but man, there are so many nuances between them, you really need to understand them. And with a lot of people, I mean, hey, I understand appreciation, man. I've owned businesses. I understand wanting to maximize everything I spend money on. But we can't drag along this long tail into the cloud and expect it to do all the things it did for us on-prem in these cloud environments. Cloud native is absolutely critical, and the data bears this out. Now, I like to point this out because a lot of people, hey, is it really dangerous in the cloud? And what this really highlights is two things. One, yes, there's lots of people out trolling for uh, nefarious activities. And two, it, it just really shows that there's a lot of foolish people out there not really uh, uh, taking care of, uh, making sure they have zero trust, as was so appropriately put. So we stood up an account and we put a honeypot in front of them. We want to find out who's going to check us out. The other thing that this really is going to demonstrate is how all the bad guys are using the tools against us, namely automation, uh, bots, uh, the whole idea of automating the process of finding their target. In 15 minutes, we had you know, some 150 different door rattles and uh, you know, shaking on the windows in a week's time. Nearly 4 million attacks or attempts to get in to nothing. And that's what's so extraordinary. But this just really highlights they're using all of this automated process. The minute a new account comes on, they're checking it out to find out if those foolish mistakes are being made, leaving ports open, leaving uh, data um, uh, storage like S3 buckets uncrypted. Now, I suspect many of you have heard of this. This is really, uh, for me, is even funnier because I put this presentation together with Shira Shambon, oh, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago. A lot of people use MongoDB. I suspect uh, you're familiar with it. And it's very, very popular. And I suspect many of you know Shodan. We did some research. How many occurrences of MongoDB are there out in the wild? And you can see 60,463 is what we found. But this is what's amazing. Either using default or no passwords, over 23,000. Now, I said I did this almost two years ago. Well, I don't know, maybe there was a black hat in the audience because you can see from an article July 2nd, just a week or so, two weeks or whatever ago, almost 23,000 days. I mean, it's a little bit of a quinky dink that it's so close to the number that we were showing are out there unprotected, but it just goes to show it's happening all the time. So if there's a slide that really highlights the need for visibility, it's this one. 
to think that one out of four don't even know if they've been hacked, this is frightening. So what's going on? Listen, there's increasing pressure because of the subtleties and nuances, right? They're both swimming holes. The problem is uh, the complexity is increasing. We don't have more people. We don't have the time because we're drinking from a fire hose to go out and learn all this new stuff that's coming at us so fast. And sprawl has become such an unbelievable problem. It, it, it's huge. And we have new attack surfaces, new ways, because it's, it's me anywhere in the world. I'm using repositories. I'm using Azure for my main and uh, Google for my uh, failover or backup. I mean, there are all kinds of hyper-connected environments. And all the while, the tools we're using are young and and immature, and the fact of the matter is, look, this is a fact from Gartner, a stat, I shouldn't say fact, but what they put out just fact, through 2023, at least 99%, and I always say, at least 99%, how can it at least mean there's gonna be more? This is a real issue, why we need to protect you from you. This was already mentioned. Right? And so I'm going to just show a quick few examples of breaches that commonly occur. Uh, S3 buckets or storage being left unencrypted and exposed. Huge problem. People get confused. It's in and of. Okay? In is what you're responsible for. Of is what the cloud providers are responsible for. So anything you put in it, you've got to keep it patched and maintained. And in this hyper-connected world, this really becomes a big challenge because not only are the things you're supposed to be patching, like cigarette, if you heard about uh, recently, that's a huge one. We're also getting these very hyper-connected vulnerabilities or exploits where an attack is, because the chain has gotten so long and we're using so many different resources, it's much, much easier to find just one weak link and to exploit it. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, they're vulnerable, you know, I, you know, cloud networks are susceptible. Uh, we have to make sure that we're always looking for uh, bad stuff. We, ha we, we, we have this, this whole uh, shared responsibility model is very, very confusing for a lot of people. And what we have is this inconsistency because it's all shifted to an API world and using APIs that are not delivered consistently from all the different vendors can be very, very difficult. Now they're getting much, much better. They understand that security is a big challenge for you and they need to reduce those challenges and risks and it's why you see them defaulting with more security on as opposed to off, you know, encryption for storage, for example. We're seeing more really exciting new tools, I'll go back quickly, um, that that are taking advantage of and offering better security. And let me be clear, Google has awesome security. Microsoft, awesome security. Uh, Amazon, awesome security. The challenge is the consistency, the homogenization across all of the environments, all of the different Kubernetes and functions and containers and everything that you have in your environment. Few key trends I wanna go through and I, I, I wanna make sure I do my best to stay on time. Uh, everybody's talking about shift left, shift left, shift left. I'm just about to publish a blog that says, teach right before you shift left. Because while this is powerful, as was previously mentioned, you know, the problem is no fault of the developers. They just do what they've always been doing and oops, they leave a port open, for example. So we need to do a better job teaching our developers as we release them into this powerful new uh, CI, CD pipeline environment as opposed to the traditional waterfall or, or agile environment. It's really powerful. It really is uh, gonna uh, release or unshackle you, but it's also requires new training and you need to really make sure your developers are ready to be there. You need to automate. This is the only way you can actually build an environment that's more secure. And that's actually something that uh, uh, has been stated also uh, by Gartner. But you have to notice the nuances. One small error, I think uh, Rick mentioned it earlier, you know, one small boo-boo and, and it could bring the house down. And so we need to realize when we turn into and start to actually utilize automation tools to take action, 
we got to really uh, uh, make it right. And then lastly, containers, man, they're going like wildfire. It's expected to explode. And um, it's really something if you're not doing it, you ought to take a look at. So listen, you have to keep protecting everything, everything like you've always done and all of the same practices have to be applied. You really need to dive into DevOps, uh, uh, trying to achieve DevSecOps as they say. And really that's just bringing together your operations and your security teams, your development and your security teams and make sure that they're all collaborating. You'll get huge benefits from that. Secure all clouds. Look for an environment that can homogenize and harmonize all of these public, private, uh, uh, virtual cloud environments. It's really, really important. And look for cloud native as often as possible. Look for tools that can homogenize and harmonize all of this rich data that you're going to be able to have. I've got some great resources I'll just throw up. I'll quickly move through this. If you'd like to receive them, let me know. This is an ebook that we put together with Amazon on how to build six steps to automating your compliance. Another uh, resource um, is it's encouraged. You see the link here, uh, get trying containers. If you're not doing it, select some standalone app and go and, and really uh, get started with it because it is, you know, I think Twain said the best way to get ahead is to get started. Um, it's really an environment that's gonna be very, very powerful coming up. So. We've got another really great security blueprint that I can provide. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but it's very, very detailed document that helps you understand the critical importance of segmentation and uh, micro segmentation and all of the things you really need to be looking at in the cloud. I'm happy to share it with you. You know, we need to get tools that make us uh, protecting. Did you know that in the cloud, in AWS, for example, there's some 200 capabilities that don't have any undo. So this idea of poking around and trying to figure out how to undo, oops, I didn't want to do that. We, we can't do that. We need to learn this environment. It's very complex. There's lots of new attack services. Go out, get some experts. There's tons of training. Just search for training, uh, uh, you know, CBT. It's, avail it's available for free or near free from just about every one of the cloud providers. And, and listen, the bad guys are out there using these tools against you. I encourage you to go out and use them to effectively bolster your environment. And with that, I want to thank you. I appreciate it. I've got a podcast. I'd love for you to hear it. It's Talking Cloud. Check it out. And with that, I'm going to quit sharing, and I'm back at you. All right. Yeah, let's see if we have some questions for you. Uh, let me take a look. And we've got, let's see, right over here. All right. Um, let me just read from the bar here. With regards to... Um, Let's see this right here. Sorry, my screen just popped out. Okay. All right. Is it possible, um, you know, to make cloud more secure than your own data center? Yeah. So, you know, I, I mentioned that briefly in the presentation. So there's a document. I don't have it with me right now. It was published October last year by Neil McDonald and Tom Kroll from Gartner. And the headline is, you can, you know, how to make your public cloud more secure than your data center. And it suggests you can uh, through the combination of automation, through the combination of uh, best practices, zero trust, micro segmentation, as well as cloud native protections and tools. And or double double authentication as well, I'm sure. Oh, you know, multi-factor authentication is imperative, but one of the things that it lays out, a, you know, it's got its traditional pyramid architecture guide with each layer going up. And the first layer that it recommends is a posture management solution. And the posture management is the product, the tool that's going to protect you from you with uh, orchestration, configuration. I always say it's kind of, if you think of, if any of if you have ever went bowling and you've taken your kids or grandkids, you know, they can put those bumpers down alongside yeah. the lane. That's what posture management does. It makes sure that you don't throw a gutter ball and at least hit uh, the pins at the other end. Yeah, I've been doing that for many, many years in the uh, in the bowling <laughs> Hey, we haven't been to a bowling alley in, uh, in six 
months, right? Uh, yeah, not unless you got one in your basement, I guess. No, no. Uh, what are the <laughs> biggest operational headaches when moving to the cloud? So, you know, it was mentioned earlier, it really, the, the compliance is a big challenge. It can't be understated. Uh, and this is because of the constantly moving environment. The, the drift off of policy is really, really uh, uh, very susceptible. You're very susceptible to that drift. And as a result, um, this is what creates operational challenges because we're so accustomed to an environment where we can kind of go and configure the policy for compliance and, and then just check it now and then. And, and those days are really gone when you're using public cloud, especially when you have this, you know, almost breathing environment that heaves up and down and, and moves around based on, you know, where it needs to. Okay. And, and last but not least, um, person asks, why do we need a third party tools of security? Don't the cloud providers offer good security on their own? They do, they do. Uh, and I mentioned this, and this is one of the, you know, I think, I, I think it's horrible. I've heard other vendors kind of imply with their nuanced in, uh, uh, in, implications that, you know, the security is not any good from any of the main cloud providers. Listen, I will guarantee you, Google, Amazon, Microsoft build a better data center than any of us can build more secure, more robust, no question. And the tools they're providing are unbelievably powerful. The issue is they're not all equal. I always say they're all summiting the same mountain, but they're taking different paths. And let me give you a crystal clear example. AWS has a completely different approach to identity and access management than does Microsoft. Why? Because Azure, and Microsoft have Active Directory. And Active Directory plays a profound and significant role in their architecture, and Amazon don't have no Active Directory. So these sacred cows that can also be turned into Trojan horses result in different alternatives, but ultimately we're all offering elastic compute environments with function capabilities and containers and Kubernetes and so on, right? So. It, it, you need a tool that you can lay across all of these disparate and different environments and have it be presented in a consistent and uniform way. That's the key. Right, having a good dashboard. Well, that's great. Yep. Well, uh, hey, thank you for your time today. Uh, I loved your animated you. uh, interaction with us. It was wonderful. And hopefully we will Can't see help it. Hey. Well, hopefully we'll see you at one of our virtual cybersecurity summits. I think we will. And most importantly, I hope to maybe see you at one of our live events in 2021 when we get back to uh, doing things in person. Me too, Brad. But thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all very much for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity. And Grant, I'm happy to tell you that nobody dropped off during your presentation. Woohoo! That's great. That's great. All right. Thank bring you. Up our, Look forward you got to hearing from you guys. You got it. All right, we're going to bring up our last speaker, uh, and this is a, the official last uh, speaker for our Power Hour series. Uh, Ron, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, Ron, thank you so much for joining us yet again. Hey, it's good to see you. There you are. Awesome. All right. Well, well the floor is yours. This is our. This is you're the last speaker of our session. Uh, all right. Ron, so make it a good one. <laughs> <laughs> That's Pressure. my intent. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, thank you again, Bradford, uh, for for having me. Uh, thank you for everyone for staying on. Um, you know, and, and thank you for the uh, other presenters. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, and you know, I'm I'm fortunate that you know with uh, the Cyber uh, Crime Support Network, I am uh, one of their partic participating members. So. Um, it's a great, great effort that uh, Kristen and her organization is running uh, in coordination and collaboration with, with CISA. So, uh, so I'm Ron Ford. I am the cybersecurity advisor here in New England. Uh, we call it Region 1. That's how we break up our regions across the country by uh, FEMA designation. Uh, so uh, I have purview over all six New England states uh, here in the Northeast. 
Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about your uh, particular areas, uh, Cybersecurity Advisor, please feel free to message us and I'll leave my contact information up uh, as I conclude. All right, let's see if we can get this going here. Aha, all right. So I'm going to talk a, a bit about CISA's role, uh, the cyber threat landscape as we see it, uh, as well as cybersecurity and resilience. And uh, we, we essentially try to take those 30,000 uh, know, foot um, thoughts and ideas and, and try to distill them down into digestible and actionable resources and materials. So CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure, Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, we've been around by name since 2018, uh, but we are not a new organization under DHS. Uh, it was just that we uh, got our own purse uh, strings and our own budgeting uh, back in 2018. So now we are on the same playing level as FEMA, as Secret Service, as Customs and Border Patrol. Now that we can actually do our job and operationalize a lot of the efforts that we have going on, it just further promotes that. So essentially what CISA's role is and the mission is to really lead the nation's efforts to understand and manage risk to critical infrastructure. All right, so, uh, so Essentially, uh, being the nation's risk advisors, we, we try to bucket and focus on major areas. And, and we try to distill that down into four critical areas. So the first is federal network protection, where we work a lot with our federal departments and agencies uh, with regard to cyber protection. Um, comprehensive cyber protection is more, uh, more uh, vast and, and, and wide ranging, uh, where we work a lot with public uh, and private sector organizations. Uh, to ensure that we provide resources for uh, their for their uh, challenges and obstacles that they might face in terms of uh, being safe uh, in in the cyber world, uh, infrastructure resilience and field operations. Now, aside from the cybersecurity resources and, and support that we provide, we also uh, also uh, provide physical security uh, materials and resources. So, if you're thinking about the guards, the gates, the guns. Uh, you know, the physical design and security that goes into a lot of the, the facilities. Uh, that's where we also provide uh, assessments and resources as well. And then the last uh, area that we focus on is emergency communications. So those emergency responders and making sure that they have the communications networks that are, uh, that are really key for them to share information uh, at a moment's notice. So today's uh, risk landscape. Uh, this should not look uh, uh, unfamiliar to you, as you probably have seen. There's a, uh, you know, a lot of cyber attacks that are happening nowadays. Uh, you know, uh, concurrently running with, you know, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, you know, I think these are really trying times that we're all really faced with, and it obviously creates a lot of stressors uh, within our own environments, both personally and professionally. So these are just, you know, you know, concurrent and parallel. Uh, risks that we all have to think about and consider as we continue to operate and continue to make sure that all the business functions that are that are key to success, to the success that they're continuing to operate. I'm going to go a little bit into the threat landscape, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but you know I, I like the term that was used a little earlier about being hyper focused, um, you know, and, and being hyper connected, uh, uh, you know, with regard to there's so many, you know, access points for data nowadays where, you know, we have it in our cars, we have it in our phones, we have it, uh, you know, uh, you know, our thermostats. We're, we have so much access information. It also comes with the risk, you know, of someone being able to access that information or exploit that information. So we have to be considered, we have to be considerate about you know, providing uh, or implementing safeguards and protections to all those different uh, access points, whether it's, you know, working with our water facilities or, you know, you're programming your, your new, uh, you know, refrigerator to make sure that you have, you know, enough uh, avocados or, you know, you're using Uber. You know, these are all new fantastic data points that we have to make our, our lives more efficient and to provide us with much information that's how we can make some, some key decisions.
but it, again, it, it comes at a risk where we have to be aware of what those potential risks are associated with uh, having so much access and providing uh, a lot more information to our key decisions that we all uh, are involved in. I'm not going to belabor this either. Uh, most common cyber threats, you know, they were talked about earlier um, you know, with regard to ransomware, uh, to phishing campaigns. So I would say within the sphere of technology and, and, and cybersecurity, you know, these are terms that we all are familiar with. I think the challenge that I've seen in my experience uh, up here is that we have to level set everyone's expectation on what they understand that these are, how, what does this mean to people, you know, the average citizen. And, and I like the, the way that uh, Kristen uh, framed it earlier was about there's a vast amount of information out there, but, you know, how do we ensure that, uh, you know, that the average citizen is able to understand what does it mean to, you know, be a victim of ransomware? What is ransomware? What are, you know, what is a phishing campaign? We have to continue to level set the the environment so that you know we're not the only ones you know within the security sphere who are uh you know who are aware of what this really means we have to also translate this into how does this affect business as well so speaking of uh, business cybersecurity risks are business risks there's no doubt about it technology affords us so much access to information to make those informed decisions Again, it, it, it introduces a whole new uh, area of risk to data that we all depend on to continue to make those informed decisions. And so we need to be considerate about that, whether it's, you know, looking at the availability of the data, you know, from the cloud solutions that, we, that were referenced earlier, but also looking at the integrity of the data and making sure that it is in its original and, and intended form, as well as making sure that we have proper access to that data. And, and you know, there's another example that was referenced earlier about, uh, you know, the, the deceased, uh, you know, super user who has access, you know, ha who had, you know, access to a lot of different areas in the company. Uh, you know, we have to ensure that we have some common understanding of what that really means, but also how do we continue to manage that risk moving forward? All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity and resilience. So the, the way that CISA, that we really try to focus and level set our, you know, people's understanding, whether it's a public sector entity or a private, you know, industry organization, is we really try to focus on the critical service. And we can talk about, you know, the crown jewels of the organization. What are those key critical services? Uh, you know, functions that need to be operating, you know, that need to continue to operate when there is some type of disruption. So we talk about the assets. We talk about, you know, the people, the people who actually are doing the job, who are servicing, who are managing. Uh, we talk about the information that's being created and processed. Uh, we focus on the technology as well as the actual facilities that they reside in. So those are really important key foundational pieces to the organization that provide, you know, the operational services to accomplish the mission. Now, when those are disrupted, how did that impact the organization and the mission? You know, if you have disruptions to, you know, uh, to key areas, you have to think about, you know, what are some of the alternatives? And, and that goes into kind of the pre-planning and documentation that, you know, a lot of organizations uh, that are, you know, more robust, more mature, they tend to have those resources already in place that they can, they can actually navigate around, you know, some moderate to severe disruptions without, you know, uh, significantly impacting the business mission. So when we talk about that impact, we really, we're really talking about how resilient organizations are. So I like to use the analogy of your health. You know, uh, how do you become healthy? You know, can you buy good health? Can you buy good solutions? You know, can you manufacture good health? Well, you can't buy it. You know, you can't buy it in just one product or, you know, a series of products. Good health and resilience are both emergent properties. So 
if you think about, you know, eating, you know, eating healthy, you know, uh, you know, you know, having, you know, the, the, the candy in moderation, you know, uh, you know, exercising, uh, getting your checkups. You know, if we look at that in terms of technology and cybersecurity, those are what we call those, those standard practices and, and best practices that will help to build up the overall resilience of not only the network, but the people through uh, training and education, uh, through technology and solutions, making sure that they have adequate training to, 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 to perform their job and manage operations. So it, it really does uh, become a comprehensive effort to continue to be resilient. All right, let's see here. Oops, did I zoom in here? There we go. All right. So working towards cyber resilience, and, and I drew a, a nice dotted uh, uh, you know, rectangle around the, the top here because that's what I really wanted you all to focus on is once you start to think about, you know, and you can think about business resilience. You know, it, it, you know. In, in addition to cyber resilience, you want to ensure that that your critical services can continue to operate, and there has to be some type of framework, some process that you can rely upon. So, if you look at the dotted uh, the the tops of the uh, the columns here that are uh, horizontally dotted, you know, we look at these as steps to ensure that you know, you're able to reduce the impact of some type of disruption, whether it is intentional or unintentional. So we look at, you know, the first step is identifying what those key critical services are. You know, what are those uh, services that without a doubt are, you know, the top, you know, priority for the business, for the organization. Once you've identified that, great. You can move on to the next step. Now you have to real, you know, you have to kind of do some type of evaluation or assessment to identify what are those key assets, what are the key people, what's the key technology, you know, what are those key things that help to support that service, and you have to start to document it. Moving on to that, you have to start to identify what are the security requirements that we might that we might need to consider when we are identifying those key assets, you know. Do we need some type of comprehensive cybersecurity plan? Do we need to ensure that we're implementing, you know, the proper security controls around, you know, the, these key critical services? And, you know, also looking at, you know, how are we doing network segmentation so that we can ensure that if there is some bad actor or, or if there's some disruption, that those critical services and those assets are not as impacted as they could have been had there been, you know, uh, you know, a kind of a flat network. So that goes into managing the disruption. Again, you know, you want to less, you know, you want to reduce the impact of those key critical services, uh, and, and so that you can continue operating. So that's when we start to talk about, you know, your business continuity plans, you know, your contingency plans, the disaster recovery plans. Do you have these types of documentation? you know, in place so that if and when something does happen, you know, you're not fumbling around, you're, you're in a much uh, better place to respond to the event and get, you know, and get yourself back up and running at a much quicker pace than you would if you didn't have all these key things in place. And the last part, you know, that we really try to emphasize is once you've done all of this, and, and again, this is not a zero-sum game. We understand that there's a you know there's a gradual maturity uh, you know around this and, and developing the plans and developing you know the sustainment requirements and creating the asset inventory. Once you've gotten to a place where you're comfortable enough, you know that you feel that you want to go and run through some type of what we call the tabletop exercise, where you gather all the the key people who can make the decisions uh, around those uh, those key services. You want to see how well the organization can respond and act when there is some type of disruption. So you know that you're not, you know, you're you're not, you know, designating the engineer right on the spot. They already know what their what their role is prior to uh, the disruption happening. So when you start to exercise and go through those processes, uh, you know, within you know the tabletop exercise or whether it's a functional exercise, you can feed that back into your plan. 
so that you're much better prepared, you know, when there is an actual disruption. All right, let's see. So I wanted to go a little bit into uh, our insights about COVID-19. And so CISA released the risk management uh, for uh, novel uh, co uh, coronavirus uh, back in uh, mid-March, um, or actually I think it was April, um, that really focused on helping executives think through some of those challenging aspects, you know, regarding COVID-19 and how it affects uh, you know the supply chain, uh, as well as cybersecurity issues that may may have arise, you know, have uh, risen, you know, regarding the spread of from COVID-19. Now that we're all working, you know, in a virtual environment, and those who can work from a virtual environment, how does that really impact the organization? Whether it's network capacity or switching everyone over, you know, transitioning everyone over to virtual private network connections, uh, ensuring that. You know their uh, their roles are in their access is still uh, you know uh, is still necessary and appropriate. So we looked at this and we we put together this guide so that we could start to provide some level of resource and materials. And so within that guide, we talk about the actions for infrastructure protection from both a physical as well as from a cybersecurity standpoint. We also talked about supply chain and what the impacts for organizations uh, regarding supply chain. Uh, we talk about cybersecurity for the organizations as well as the actions for your for your workforce and for your consumers. If you're interested in learning more about what we are doing in terms of COVID-19, please feel free to go to our website. It's cisa.gov, that's C-I-S-A dot G-O-V forward slash coronavirus. All right, so a little bit more about our resources. Uh, so. Again, we have a lot of resources that we've uh, that we've provided uh, over the last few months. Uh, the biggest thing that we've uh, that we've put out so far, and this actually happened uh, last week, was the CISA services catalog. You know, so this is intended to be kind of our the starting point for organizations that are interested in learning more about the services that CISA has to offer, whether it's looking at physical security whether it's looking at cybersecurity and resources and training and materials, we wanted to provide a one-stop shop for organizations uh, if they're interested in learning more about what DHS and what CISA has to offer. Uh, I will say that all the resources that we have to offer are free. They are free to anyone who wants to use them. Uh, we hold no regulatory obligation or authority other than chemical hazards. Uh, so all of our resources and all of our engagements and partnerships are done on a voluntary basis. And we do pride ourselves on building those relationships and partnerships with organizations from a local level. The second is the Cyber Essentials Toolkit. Again, it's a, it's a help to provide uh, uh, organizations with a roadmap on uh, getting familiar with cybersecurity. How can they start to implement uh, some of the tools and resources uh, as well? The last I wanted to point out is the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, we are partnered with uh, them. They are nonprofit as well, uh, where they help to promote uh, some key uh, resources and materials for the average citizen as well as small and, and medium-sized businesses. Uh, they are one of our key partners for National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about uh, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is in October of every year, uh, please feel free to send us uh, any questions that you might have, or if you want more information, please feel free to send a message uh, my way. All right, so uh, one of the key things I also wanted to point out was uh, earlier this month, CISA released the, uh, the uh, publication for securing industrial control systems. Uh, so this is a brand new strategy that we developed that provides a network or provides a framework for guidance for strengthening uh, and unifying uh, ICS, Industrial Control System Security. Uh, essentially, we've always been in the ICS business, uh, but this helps to recodify our commitment uh, with our partners as well. And it's really focused on five key pillars about you know, uh, asking more from our ICS community and helping to deliver more to, to them and our partners. 
Uh, the second is to develop and utilize the technology to help mature collective ICS cyber defense. So within the ICS realm and within operational technology, we know that there are challenges. We know that there are nuances that you, you just you know, have to be aware of that might disrupt you know, the function of those critical uh, ICS uh, you know, assets. So we have to keep that in mind as well. The third is about building some deep data capabilities to analyze and deliver information for our, our ICS partners so that we can continue to disrupt and reduce uh, the likelihood that they'll be a victim of a cyber incident. The last area is, you know, we're talking about informing, um, you know, enabling and informing proactive security investments. You know, we understand, again, the challenge and the nuance within the ICS realm, understanding that, you know, there's a 99%, you know, uptime for a lot of those critical services. So we really don't want to impact the functionality of them, but we understand that there are serious threats to those systems. And how can we uh, help enable uh, you all uh, and our partners to take advantage of some of those services while understanding that we can't solve everything? We want to ensure that, you know, whether we can refine tools or services that we're being an, an enabler. All right, so I'm going to get a little bit into our cybersecurity services. So the, the one thing I, I wanted to continue to address, you know, and I, I talked a, a small bit about this before, is about, you know, when we step through that framework that I highlighted earlier, you know, it, it, it's always good to do some type of assessment, whether it's the table type exercise that could be considered an assessment or you're doing some type of network penetration testing. You know, it's good to start from somewhere. So that you can understand, you know, A, what needs to be protected? You know, not everything needs to have as many uh, layers of comprehensive security around them, but you need to understand, you know, from day one, when you implement security controls and you develop your, your key documents, you know, what are the key, those crown jewels that need to have, you know, some type of, you know, layered and comprehensive plan around them? So that's where we talk about performing those periodic assessments so that you can understand, you know, where in the priority do those key assets lie so that you can continue to ensure that they, uh, that they are, uh, that they have as much, uh, you know, uh, security controls and, and, and comprehensive uh, security around them as well. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my program and, and, and where, I, where I reside. So I'm a part of CISA's Cybersecurity Advisor Program. So again, our mission is to be that local level, uh, you know, effort, um, you know, that local level connection to help strengthen the security and resilience of America's critical infrastructure. In a nutshell, I perform a, a host of different uh, capabilities and, and uh, resources where I go out and perform cyber risk assessments, it's all, uh, you know, primarily it's interview-based where we're talking about maturity of processes that support those critical services, you know, or we're looking at the implementation of security controls, you know, and we're looking at external dependencies, you know, for organizations, knowing that, you know, everything is hyper-connected now, whether it's the supply chain or you're a vendor, you know, we know that there are, you know, connection challenges and, and nuances where, you know, you have to consider not only yourself, but you have to consider you know, your vendors and, you know, your, your, your second and third supply chain partners as well. Uh, we do a lot of promoting. I do a lot of promoting of, of best practices and mitigation strategies. Uh, I build a lot of partnerships, uh, again, you know, highlighting back to the cyber uh, crime uh, support network. Uh, you know, it's one of those key things as, as, as a cybersecurity advisor that we are, that we're really keen on is continuing to cultivate partnerships. Uh, education is a, is, a, is a key area where, you know, we, we get called in a lot to provide uh, awareness training, you know, for staff. You know, it's really good to understand, you know, where our key partners are in terms of readiness and resilience and, and, and understand how can we be better stewards uh, of, of education. Uh, I do a, quite a bit of listening as well. I know I talk a lot, but I also do a, a quite a bit of, of listening as well. Um, to understand what are the challenges, what are the problems that our partners face, 
how can we continue to refine our services so that we can be better, uh, better stewards uh, of those products. And the last bit is, is coordinating. Uh, we also do a, a, a bit of coordination support. When there is a significant cyber incident, uh, when I could, I would travel and, and be on site with our, uh, with our partners so that we could provide uh, so certain levels of assistance and support and then take back lessons learned on, you know, how can we continue to improve. So we have this continuous, lear uh, continuous loop of providing lessons learned, you know, back to, to the headquarters, you know, down in Virginia so that we can continue to refine our services and products as well. So here's a here's a, a notional breakdown of where we currently have cybersecurity advisors deployed around the country. So I'm I'm up in the uh, northeast here in New England, uh, and we are actually uh, in the midst of a hiring uh, a hiring craze right now, where we're actually uh, looking to increase staffing uh, by 100%. Uh, we currently have 24 cybersecurity advisors uh, located across the country, so. Uh, if you're interested, please feel free to visit our website, or you can send an email to us at cyberadvisor at cisa.gov. We're, we're looking for highly qualified, uh, you know, candidates uh, to fulfill and support the mission as well. All right. So the last couple of slides here talk about some of the resources that we that we uh, that we have uh, at the local level. Uh, again, my uh, my uh, you know my program, the Cybersecurity Advisor Program. Uh, I'm going to jump down to the Protective Security Advisors because I want to give them a shout out as well, where they also provide those physical security assessments. They also provide uh, you know uh, liaison uh, you know efforts as well between uh, government and private sector. Uh, if you think about some of those uh, large venue uh, events such as the Super Bowl. Uh, such as the Kentucky Derby, you know, we have a hand in that as well from our from our PSAs, where they are working with local and state government officials uh, as well as industry uh, to ensure that they have the resources that they need, and we can provide them with assessments to help to help continue to drive down their risk. All right, so. The range of cyber, uh, cybersecurity assessments, this is just a small snippet of the assessments or, or and some of the services that we provide. If you go to our services catalog, we have over 50, uh, which you know, seems to be quite a bit, uh, but they're tailored. You know, we want to make sure that we're not offering everything to everyone. We want to make sure that we can help continue to target resources to specific areas in, in industry so that they can take advantage of those, uh, of those offerings. But, you know, from either a strategic standpoint or from a technical standpoint, we try to capture, uh, you know, resilience in a, in a comprehensive manner. You know, I, I talked a bit about maturity. I talked a bit about uh, the external dependencies as well. You know, that looks at more uh, of from a governance in a strategic standpoint, but we also have our technical resources that, you know, we, we, we try to ensure that we give you uh, both sides of the, of, the, of the coin in terms of resources. Um, again, you'll have these uh, these slides for uh, uh, for yourselves after uh, the presentation, after the the cybersecurity summit. But this is just a good snapshot of you know how CISA is trying to help manage and tackle cyber risk. And one of the things I try to point out, um, you know, in you know in throughout my presentations is that risk can look different for a lot of different organizations. You know, whether we're talking about technical risk, we're talking about, you know, operational risk, you know, or we're talking about, you know, from a higher level, we're talking about business risk. You know, we have to engage at certain levels to, under, to make sure that we are all talking the same language uh, because we, we, we tend to talk in our own, our own, uh, our own language. Uh, however, when we talk to different audiences, we have to ensure that we're talking uh, with the right uh, intent, you know, and to ensure that we can offer and we can provide assistance as, as appropriate. So the last is, you know, essentially about best practices. You know, we really do try to in, 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 in emphasize that you make your own luck. You know, uh, of course, you're going to need leadership buy-in. 
Uh, you know, they have to really own the issue. Uh, we talk about cyber hygiene, you know, the blocking and the tackling, making sure that you're able to, uh, you know, uh, implement the proper and appropriate secu security controls. Uh, risk management, you know, what can the organization ac accept? You know, what's the equation? What's the balance look like between uh, transferring uh, risk, accepting risk, and rejecting risk? You know, how does that impact the mission, and, you know, of the organization? You know, I emphasize about being prepared. You know, I can't, I can't emphasize that anymore. We have to be prepared nowadays. Uh, if an organization thinks that they are not going to be a target uh, of a cyber disruption or a cyber attack, you know, those days are long gone. Everyone is a target because you never know, you know, what the impact might be to you, but also to your customers and your partners as well. Uh, so you have to keep in mind that even though you think you, you might be a small target, you might be a connecting piece to a much larger issue, a much larger problem. The last couple of areas I like to talk about are being able to defend and continue to operate. I emphasized that when we looked at that process. You know, how, how, how is the organization, you know, posed and, and, and positioned to continue to operate when there is some level of disruption? And the last is leveraging those relationships. Um, I'm sure you, you all have heard about exchanging business cards before something happens. It's key. It's important. I can't emphasize that any more uh, than what you've heard so far. You know, those partnerships are, are incredibly valuable. Uh, so when there is some type of disruption, you know, in your real life, in your real work life, that you're able to make the call or you're able to understand who's going to be able to help you when there is some type of disruption. So you don't want to make that first call when you are in a level of distress. You want to make that connection. You want to make that partnership prior to that. And I'll leave it open for questions and I'm going to, I'm going to leave uh, my slide up with my contact info and information as well. Uh, there are a lot of links here, but I wanted to make sure that, that you all had as much information that I could share with you. So, again, Bradford, thank you very much for having me, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll open up for questions. You got it. It's funny. We used to start with sport jackets and ties. Now we're in <laughs> <laughs> the COVID. You know, what, what, what's changed here? So, uh, a couple yeah. of questions here. Um, they said, please post the email address for CISA, obviously. That's already up there. You talked about service and uh, job openings. Where would people be able to apply for these jobs? Because we do have quite a few um, cybersecurity professionals that may want to join your agency. How would they do that? Sure. Well, great that you asked that. I actually have the link in my contact info here. It's www.cisa.gov forward slash CSA. You can go there, take a okay. look at the description. It'll also, I believe it'll also send you over to the USA Jobs uh, job announcement, and you can also take a look at it there. Terrific. Quick question as well, um, and it's usually a yes. Can we share the slides with our audience on our website? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. We just got that one. And is there anything else? I I think that is about it. I know you've joined us quite a few times already, and hopefully we'll see you at one of our live summits in 2021. Uh, yeah. And uh, we do have 16 virtual, uh, almost a full day long of cybersecurity summits, the official cybersecurity summits. And uh, those are going to be two, three times a month. Uh, so it's less travel, but, uh, you know, constantly on the computer and, uh, and producing these things. Okay. Um, oh, here's a good one. Um, this is a question about, do you not see data privacy? <clears throat> um, something about data privacy. This is a question, Mr. Ford, do you not see data yeah. privacy? <clears throat> uh, uh, data privacy at all? Sure. Uh, so that's a, that's a broad, uh, broad phrase and, and sure. you know, data privacy can take, you know, many different uh, perspectives. And so, for for DHS and, and for CISA, we look at data privacy as uh, something that is, you know, it, it's embedded within whatever service that we're offering, 
or some of the you know resources that we offer in terms of education and awareness. Uh, we do talk about data privacy. Uh, it's not necessarily something that you know that we just continue to highlight, but it is you know it is an important piece to what we provide, what we offer, as well as what we try to promote. Um, you know, in terms of you know data integrity. You know, I talked about that earlier. You know, ensuring that you have proper controls. Um, you know, and, and what was you know talked about earlier. You know, from Grant. You know, we have to ensure that data privacy and integrity. You know, is, is key. You know, it's it's the bedrock for everything that we do. You know, so and if you're willing, if you're offer, if you're willing to share information with us, we also have trusted programs where you can uh, sign up with us to receive, you know, uh, intel information from open source, um, you know, threat information. We have a lot of different resources that we can provide as well. If you're interested in learning more about, you know, threat information as well as, you know, learning more about, you know, what are some of the privacy and liability uh, implications associated with, you know, cybersecurity risk. Okay. Um, here's a uh, comment slash somewhat of a question. Is there a um, <clears throat> CISA student internship program? Aha, there is. So we have our Cyber Core. Uh, and Great. I believe it is on our website. If you go to CISA.gov, uh, I believe there is a careers uh, link in there. Uh, and we do have our own internship program underneath our Pathways internship program. Uh, so we do focus primarily on cyber uh, security uh, as that primary uh, mechanism for undergraduate and graduate students who are interested in, in getting more hands-on experience you know, within CISA, whether you're looking at whether it's a non-technical path or you're looking at you know, the, the the traditional technical path, we offer a lot of key areas for students to get experience in. So I, I encourage you to go to uh, CISA.gov, and I believe it is under our careers page. That's great. And they did, uh, whoever they are, have predicted millions of cybersecurity vacancies. So uh, what a great way to start someone's career, uh, you know, especially for if there are any students out there or parents of students out there watching this, um, certainly uh, a wonderful industry that is not going anywhere. And uh, job security is, is certainly uh, paramount <laughs> within cybersecurity. Yeah. If I can add, uh, Bradford, you know, um, yeah. with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with, our, uh, with our student programs, we, we do offer also um, through one of their programs that you're able to uh, essentially uh, you know, work with us. We'll uh, we'll help to pay for part of your tuition. You know, at your at your college. You know, and, right. yeah, and you'll yeah, and the, the the continuing service agreement with that is, you know, you work with us or we pay so much of your tuition, and you know, you have to either work with the federal agency or with the state uh, government agency for a certain amount of time, and your tuition, you know, has essentially been reduced. You know. By uh, by you know certain amount. So there's some there's some initiatives that we're we're trying to promote with those various programs as well. Great. Well, we could leave it off on, on that note because cyber is certainly the future, and we're living in that future right now. So uh, Ron, thank you so much for your service to our country. Uh, thank you for your time with all of uh, the presentations that you've given, and we will see you, I'm sure, at one of our official cyber summits coming up soon. Thank you, Bradford. All right. Thank you. And for those that are still with us. For those that have an active security clearance, we uh, are also the producer of Tech Expo, and those are virtual hiring events. I put the website Tech Expo USA in the chat box. So if you are looking to evaluate new positions in the defense industry, in the cybersecurity industry, check out Tech Expo USA, and you can see uh, what is coming up. Obviously, those events are free, of course, and uh, we invite you to check those out. And uh, we've got the contact and follow-up information for uh, Kristen and Dave from Duo Security, Grant from Checkpoint, and of course, Ron Ford from the DHS. Thank you so much. This has been a great uh, series. Uh, this is our last 
uh, power hour, uh, for at least for the time being. And we hope to see you at the cybersecurity summits that we will be holding two, three, four times a month focused on various regions of the United States. And obviously, all of the details are on cybersummitusa.com. Uh, thank you so much for your time. You uh, stay safe and uh, stay secure. And thank you so much for uh, joining us for the last three months. Over and out. Bye-bye. We created IoT Nation to help professionals like you navigate the IoT space to find the companies, people, use cases, and events that are most relevant for you. On IoT Nation, you can browse over 25,000 IoT-related companies and dive into the details for specific ones. You can also search geographically, zoom into any area of the map, and explore companies in any city. You can find applications in various verticals, such as smart buildings, smart cities, connected mobility, and many more. And you can plan your week and month ahead by searching dozens of online and offline events to find the ones that are most relevant for you. For all Cyber Summit Power Hour attendees, we are offering free use of IoT Nation Pro for 30 days with the code Cyber2020V. If you have any questions, contact us at info at iotnation.com.